to you. Thank you so much for being with us today for worship. If you're here as a guest, thank you so much for joining us this day. Uh, go ahead and open your Bibles with me to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. Uh, this week we're closing out this series in the book of Jonah. Next week we'll be looking at uh, the seven churches in seven letters to the churches in Revelation. So if you can come back and join us for that. Uh, uh, just thank you so much for the past five weeks for your grace and patience with me. It's the first time I've ever went through a full series on a Sunday morning. Uh, just your kindness has been overwhelming, so uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, if you would, if you're there with me at Jonah chapter 4, let me go ahead and invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Drop down there with me at verse 11. It says, And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Can we pray? Lord, that truth is true. Your goodness runs after us each and every day. In the hard moments and both the good moments as well. God, we praise you that you're faithful, that you never give up on us, Lord. God, I pray you have steady hearts right now, calm souls. Remove all the, the ruffling and all the worries and all the everything else. God, may we be focused on you. What are use is your word, and you're clear. So, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us today? Lord, let, Lord, let us see the person of your character. And, Lord, further, let us see how we should respond in your mission, Lord. In Jesus' name. Sometimes in our lives, we are put in situations where either we have the chance to teach someone or to receive from someone a good old-fashioned life lesson. You know what I'm talking about. We try to show or to be shown what is true and real about a specific situation. Now, just like you, I've been a recipient of many of these life lessons throughout my life, but I've also had the opportunity to teach a few people some of these life lessons as well. So a few years back, me and Megan were uh, with a couple, and we were playing cornhole, and so the boards were set, and all, very quickly, the husband just started running his mouth, playing against me. So me and Megan were playing against the other couple. Well, what he didn't know was that he's running his mouth, oh, I'm going to whoop you, I'm going to do all this to you and all this and that. He didn't know for over four and a half years, me and my friends who live in between Bestford and Cherville play cornhole every single day for four or five hours at a time. And we got really good really quick. We played tournaments and all that kind of stuff. So he's running his mouth and, and I didn't say nothing. I was just smiling. We got the cornhole bags two throws in. He knew he was in trouble. He didn't score on me. We beat the socks out of that couple for at least 45 minutes till he, let's just say he was running his mouth really quickly. He just stayed quiet. He shook his head. And I said, <laughs> welcome to Bessemer City. <laughs> you see, our friend had to be taught a lesson. In that specific moment, it was a hard lesson for him to learn. It was a painful lesson to know that he needs to know when to speak and not speak. It was a good old humble lesson of life. <laughs> this morning in our text, Jonah the prophet is going to be taught a lesson from God about his mercy. Jonah, as we will see, was still completely missing the heart of God. And God is going to stop and teach his rebellious and selfish prophet a few lessons on what is really true about himself and his mercy. As we said at the beginning of the series, the main theme of the book of Jonah is that the Lord is a God of boundless mercy for all peoples. What we and Jonah will learn this morning is that the God of boundless mercy for all peoples, listen, commands his chosen people to be reflections of his mercy to all peoples as well. So here's where I'm going to go for the rest of our time. I want to look at five different lessons from God about his mercy here in Jonah 4. 
And then I want to ask the question from verse 11. If this is who God and his mercy is to all peoples, then shouldn't we as God's people be the same as well? A better way to say that is, shouldn't we see and show mercy to the world how God sees and shows mercy to it? Okay? So first, let's jump into our passage and look at five lessons on God's mercy. So as we pick up from last week, Jonah goes to Nineveh, obediently proclaims God's message, and the whole city has a revival. They repent of their sin. God shows them mercy and doesn't destroy the city. Now here in verse 1 of chapter 4, we see Jonah's response to God's mercy to the city of Nineveh. Now, you would think that as a prophet of God, he would be delighted after this type of response of the success of his mission, but that's just not the case. Verse 1 says that God's mercy toward the Ninevites exceedingly displeased Jonah. It literally made him sick. Even though Jonah had obediently went to Nineveh to proclaim God's message, we see here that his hatred towards the Assyrians is still present. He's blinded by his prejudice. He hoped that God would destroy this pagan enemy of Israel. Notice what he does. Instead of rejoicing at what God has done through him for the sake of the lost, he looks up and accuses God of being wrong. So he tries to attack God's character. He's not just mad about the results. He's actually mad at God. He says in verse 2, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah here is referencing Exodus 34, 6 through 7, and he argues with God and complains about his character and mercy. Jonah knew that Yahweh was a God who was gracious and merciful, and if there is a chance for the Ninevites to hear his message of warning that God couldn't help but to be himself. This leads us to the very first lesson that God's mercy is consistent. It's consistent. God's mercy is consistent to his own character, and it's consistent to everywhere and at all times. God can't help but to be merciful because that's just who he is. As we've said multiple times over the past few weeks, God can't help but to be himself. He is always faithful to his own character, and he will never change. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In this text, God's consistency is contrasted with Jonah's inconsistency. I would say that Jonah would make a psychiatrist today a whole lot of money. This dude is always up and down. He's never happy. He's inconsistent in his faithfulness. One second he's running away, he's wishing to die. Then he's happy and obedient. Now he's back in a pity party. This dude is a roller coaster of emotions and actions. In every respect, he is much like you and me today. Like Jonah, we're always running away from the Lord, aren't we? We're a flight risk. We say we're going to do things, but we never see it to the end. We always drop the ball. We're never content or happy. Our emotions and feelings are always up and down. We, we say we're for something or we're against something, but we're never consistent in every area of our life. We're inconsistent people. That's just who we are. We're just like Jonah. What we see here is that though we are often inconsistent, God is always consistent to his character. And this includes his mercy to all those who repent of their sin and look to him for salvation, including those who could be our worst enemies. For Jonah, he hated this reality. Notice in verse 3, he says, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Just notice the selfishness. Don't miss that. Jonah can't fathom living in a world where God's mercy is toward his enemies. 
He would rather die than to see God show mercy to Nineveh. So in anger, Jonah looks to God and accuses him of making the wrong decision. Notice the Lord's response in verse 4. It says, And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? God's question here digs to the heart of Jonah's anger. Jonah believes that God is wrong in his actions to show the Ninevites mercy. God, in response, asks this question, who's really wrong here? Jonah, are you right or is God right? This leads us to our second lesson, that God's mercy is always right. It's always right. As with this character, God's decisions and doings in the world are always consistent and perfect. He doesn't make mistakes in his decisions and actions in the world. Psalm 89, 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. He's not like us, praise God. He doesn't make biased decisions. He's, he's, he's not swayed by money or crooked politics. God is the perfect judge. His courtroom is built on righteousness and justice, and he always makes the right decision. It's impossible for him to do anything otherwise. When God chooses to place his mercy on someone, it is the right decision. No matter how we feel about it, no matter if it seems wrong to us, God's mercy is always right because he is always right. In Acts chapter 9, after Saul slash Paul encounters Jesus and is taken to Damascus because he's blind, a man named Ananias is commanded by the Lord to go and place his hands on Saul so that he can see again. Down to verse 13, Ananias answers the Lord and says, Lord, I have heard about many about this man. How much evil ha ha he, uh, he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who cast on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. See, Ananias, like Jonah, couldn't understand why God would want him to go and minister to Saul. I mean, this dude was a terrorist to his people. He was an enemy of Jesus. But what we see is that God's mercy is always right. Little did Ananias know that this once terrorist would become one of the greatest evangelists in history for the name of Jesus. Jonah in his situation was wrong. Unlike God, his feelings and discernment towards Nineveh was based on prejudice and hatred. Even if this evil city repented of their sins, in his eyes, he didn't deserve God's mercy. God here teaches Jonah that his mercy is always right. Nineveh, Nineveh believed God and at his word. They actively repented of their sin, and God rightly shows the city mercy. Now notice with me in verse 5. Again, you would think that Jonah would be happy with the results of Nineveh's deliverance. If anything, you would think that Jonah would finally learn his lesson and just listen to God. But look at what he does in verse 5. Jonah went out to the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. He's stubborn, isn't he? That's <laughs> one thing you can give him. He's stubborn. He's pretty consistent with that. He's selfish. He's so selfish that instead of listening to the Lord and rejoicing in Nineveh's repentance and accepting God's mercy toward them, he desperately goes and makes a camp outside of the city just in case if God would actually destroy the city instead. This grown man is acting like a spoiled little kid. He's, he's, you can just picture him just sitting in his little shelter pouting and wishfully just thinking, oh, maybe, maybe my greatest dreams would just come true here, that God would actually destroy Nineveh. Now, before I continue, let me ask you this question. 
How many times do we act just like Jonah here in verse 5? How many times have we stubbornly went to our Father in heaven and asked the same exact questions over and over because we didn't like the answer he has given us? Or after a result of a situation, we mope and kick around and throw a fit just like Jonah because it didn't end up how we thought it should. You see, the problem is not the answer. The problem isn't the results. The problem is you. The problem is me. We like things our own way. We want to be God. We want to receive those results in a specific way. We want to be in control. So when the Lord puts us in situations where we find out really quickly we're not in control, we just start kicking and screaming and throwing fits like Jonah in hopes that we will finally get our own way. Listen, we better be careful. Because if we're not careful... You will find yourself like crusty old Jonah who's sitting on the outside of the city in his own pity shelter, pouting and complaining that everything in life is just wrong and all against you, and completely oblivious to God's purpose and mission in this world and completely missing God's clear and direct blessings because he is so stuck in his own self and purposes. Now go with me to verses 6 through 9. As Jonah is sitting in his pity shelter, we see once again how God isn't finished with his prophet. He continues to pursue him by using the plant as an object lesson to continue to teach Jonah about his mercy. Go with me to verse 6. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Here in verses 6 through 9, we see our third lesson that God's mercy is generous. As God appoints the plant to grow over Jonah's head to save him from his, from his discomfort, notice in verse 6 that Jonah is finally happy about something. It says that Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But notice that when God appoints the worm to eat the plant, Jonah was upset that the plant had withered. This leads us to at least two issues. One being that Jonah cared more about the plant than he did for human souls. He saw more worth in the plant than he did with the worth of Nineveh. God here is showing Jonah how shallow this thinking is about people. Nineveh was an important city in the eyes of God. They meant something to him. So much so that he spares them from judgment that they did deserve. We can say it this way. God looks at the worth of individuals. He sees the value of people. Every soul matters to God. But we don't see this type of thinking in Jonah, do we? We see a man who cares more about himself than for the good of others. This leads us to the second issue that Jonah is self-centered. He's stingy with God's mercy towards other people. You see, Jonah was all good when God showed him mercy. He didn't have a problem with that. He didn't have a problem with God saving him back in chapter 2, right? He didn't have a problem with this plant that God appoints to take care of him in his discomfort. What Jonah has a problem with is the fact that God showed others who he considered as enemies mercy. As we discussed in the first week, Jonah was prejudiced towards Assyria. He hated them, hated them for who 
they were. And he believed, just like ancient Israel, that Israel alone should receive God's mercy, that they should alone receive God's covenantal blessings. You see, this attitude is the total opposite of what God intended in Israel and Jonah's salvation. The purpose for their salvation was so that they could be a light to the nations. That's the same thing for you and I this morning. They weren't supposed to store up all of God's mercy for themselves. No, they weren't supposed to build a wall that didn't allow God's mercy to flow out to other peoples. They were to share God's mercy to the nations. As we see in this text, Jonah's view and attitude of God's mercy is contrasted with God's view and attitude. Where Jonah is stingy with God's mercy, God is abundantly generous with his mercy. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, we know this passage well, but listen to the language. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Listen, God is abundantly rich. He's abundantly generous in his mercy. He's got more mercy than you and I could ever imagine. But notice this, he's not stingy with his mercy. He doesn't just keep it to himself. As we see, we have to look no further than to his son, Jesus, to see his mercy for all people. God, being rich in mercy because of how much he loved us, willfully poured out his mercy through his son at the cross and resurrection to anyone who would repent of their sin and believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord Psalm 8510 has this beautiful language. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. And that's exactly what happens at the cross. Justice was served, but mercy poured out. Jesus fully satisfied God's righteous justice as he was crucified on the cross for us. And listen, as his side was pierced, Mercy and love poured out on all repentant sinners. I love this song lyric. Blood and water, the mercy flowing from your side. A river made of endless light when my heart was running dry. That's the cross. That's the gospel. Praise God, we've got a generous Savior who willfully pours out his mercy on all those who repent and believe. Now, in verses 10 through 11, as God responds to Jonah's ignorant selfishness, he teaches him that two more lessons about his mercy. Go with me to verse 10. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? The fourth lesson we see here is that God's mercy is sovereign. It's sovereign. Jonah was concerned about a plant that he didn't even help grow. He didn't put the seed in the ground. He didn't water it. He didn't labor over this plant to grow. But even even so, he was concerned for the plant. He had compassion for the plant. God's point is simple. If Jonah is compassionate for something that he didn't create or help grow, then shouldn't God, who is the creator and sustainer of all existence, have the right to pour out his mercy on anyone and anything that he chooses? Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Romans 9, 14 through 16 says, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. 
For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Listen, God Almighty, who is the creator of everything, has the right to play his, place his mercy on anyone he chooses. As we said last week, it's not up to us. We can't force Jesus on someone. We can't tell God who he should save. That's his prerogative alone. He has the exclusive rights to pour out his mercy on anyone, anyone that he chooses. We're simply to be obedient and trust God with the results of our sovereign Savior. God's mercy is sovereign, brothers and sisters. The final lesson we see is that God's mercy is global. It's global. Go with me again to verse 11. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? You see, Nineveh here represents all of the nations in the world. They represent anyone who is outside of God's covenantal family. To Jonah's surprise, God doesn't pour out his mercy exclusively just on Israel. No, Yahweh is the God of the nations. He willfully, he purposefully pours out his mercy on all people groups, and that includes even Israel's most hated enemies. Listen to the Lord's plea in Isaiah 45. It says, Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. My, by myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. As believers, we know that this is ultimately accomplished through Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, 9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all peoples. Brothers and sisters, the lesson is simple. God's Mercy is global. It's global. Jonah wasn't supposed to hoard all of God's mercy to himself. No, he was to share God's mercy to other nations because Yahweh is the God of the nations. God cares about the nations of this earth. He cares about all people groups. His earnest desire is to be worshipped as God alone by every people group on this earth. And we know from Scripture that this will one day be accomplished perfectly. Revelation 7, 9 through 10 says this. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one can number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So what? In conclusion to this book and series, each of us are led to ask ourselves the question we find in verse 11. And should not I pity Nineveh? Should not I pity Nineveh? Commentators have said that verse 11 is the climax of the story. Everything has been building up to this point. Notice that God's question here in verse 11 is open-ended. The book doesn't come to a conclusion. We don't see how Jonah responds. We don't see if Jonah ever gets straightened out. We're just left wondering what happens to Jonah. The book simply ends with the question, and the question has no written answer. This is not a mistake, brothers and sisters. 
It ends on a question in order that each one who reads it might ask themselves the same question. Should not I pity Nineveh? You see, as God's chosen people who have received God's mercy through his son, we're now commanded to look and see the world as God sees it. To show mercy to those in the world as he shows mercy to those in the world. Matthew 9, let me invite you to turn there with me. In Matthew 9, down to verse 9, Jesus is passing through and he sees a guy named Matthew, hint the author of Matthew, who's a tax collector, who is despised by Israel. Jesus says, follow him. And all we see is that Matthew stands up and leaves his profession and begins following Jesus. And we pick up in verse 10 of Matthew 9. And it says, as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with, mut, eat, eat with tax collectors and sinners? One, uh, com, uh, one translation says, why does he eat with so much scum? It's the picture there. But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. That's what we was, that's, <laughs> yes, that's my daughter. <laughs> As I said at the beginning of the series, the book of Jonah's main message is that the Lord is a God of boundless mercy for all peoples. The final question in verse 11 leads us to this reality. If our God shows mercy to all people groups, then so should we. Let me dig this a little bit deeper. If God cares for the orphan, if he cares for the widow, if he cares for the elderly, if he cares for the oppressed or the abused or the marginalized or the sick, or the hungry, or the needy, or the homeless, listen, then so should we. If God is compassionate to the addict, to the drunkard, to the depressed, to those who are struggling with mental health, listen, then so should we. If God cares about true justice, if he cares about every color of skin if he cares about those who are confused with their sexual orientation if he cares about every nation if he cares about every soul in this world then so should we this quote was just perfect all need to reflect on the questions God asked including this final specific should I not spare Nineveh anyone who replies why is this such an important question has not understood the message. Anyone who replies no has not believed it. Listen, you can have all the knowledge in this world about God, but if that knowledge isn't pushing you to people, you're missing the point. You're missing it. God's heart is for people. It's for the nations. He desires to show his mercy to all people groups, and listen, he commands his people to do the exact same. In just a moment, we're going to be singing these song lyrics. God of salvation, you chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Where you lost your life so I can find it here. If you left that grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done, every part designed in a work of art called love. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart eight billion different ways, 
every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Like you would, again, a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Brothers and sisters, as I close... May we never forget the mercy that God showed us through his son, Jesus. That while we were still sinners, God, by his mercy, sent his perfect son to die on our behalf. And listen, as we reflect on his mercy toward us, let's look up and ask God through his spirit to give us eyes to see the world as he sees it. To place inside each of us his love for people. And then let us actively and joyfully reflect God's mercy to all peoples in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we're, we're overwhelmed this morning for your mercy. Um, Lord, you have graciously poured out your love towards all of us through your Son. And we praise you for that this morning, God. God, we see that you are a God of the nations. You're a God of peoples everywhere. And we know one day it's going to to come to completion. Your mission, oh Father, may it be actively, may we just go joyfully and proclaim your mercy to others, to show mercy to other people, Lord, to our neighbor who don't know you, Lord, to those who are confused, those who are hurt, those who are sick, God, for those who are around the world who don't even know that you exist, oh God, may we not be quiet with the mercy that you have shown us, God, but may we joyfully proclaim mercy in the name of Jesus because souls matter to you. Oh God, lead us to response. Lead us to joyfully surrendering to you and going for you because you are worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. God, we thank you. Lead us now in our response. May you be honored in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us.